evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Mahoning Drive-In Theater, the largest single-screen drive-in in the United States. We're certainly glad you could be with us this evening. And don't forget the concession stand is open with all kinds of great things to eat and drink. Eighty-nine point three Mahoning Drive-In Radio. Your old friend Virgil back once again for another exciting episode of the podcast. As you guys know, the only podcast dedicated to the revival of our beloved drive-in culture, and uh, joined as always by my co-host and general manager extraordinaire Mark. Say hello, Mark. Hello, I manage generally. <laughs> And really excited to have one of the family joining us tonight, uh, resident artist, friend, and all around great guy, Charles Moran, a.k.a. Chuck Moran, a.k.a. Horror Prince, a.k.a. Uncle Chuck. What's happening, my brother? <laughs> Hello. How are you guys? Really, really great. Really great to talk Wonderful. to you. It's been a long yes. off season to kind of put a timestamp on it. We are weeks away from the opening of the 2022 season. So really, whenever we can get to talk to uh, somebody who's connected to the theater, it's it's like a little taste. We're getting closer. But yeah, we've really Absolutely. missed We've really missed you. How's things uh, been in the off season? You've been staying busy? Yeah, been good. Um, you know, staying busy, watching movies, mm -hmm. making art, working on some uh, toys right now that I'm going to release probably in the summer. Love so it. just getting them both together and stuff like that. Living life, loving life, you know? It's a mantra. I love it. Yeah. Not taking any days for granted, that's for sure. It's beautiful. Well, for those who don't know Chuck's work or connection uh, with the Mahoning Drive-In Theater, Chuck has been doing posters for us for several years, amazing posters and uh, it's really grown beyond that. He's donated his time, his efforts, his work, um, all toward the good of the Mahoning. He's been there uh, for the roller coaster ride. And uh, like I said, on a personal level, he's been there for me uh, on for good times and bad and has become a really, uh, really great friend. Why don't you tell the story? When did you come into the fold at the Mahoning, or when did you discover kind of what we're doing at the Mahoning? If I remember correctly, my friend Nick Stranko and I heard about the place. I had heard about it for like a few years. Mm -hmm. I think like right when maybe you had taken over or decided that that was a partnership that you were going to pursue. Right. Um, it's about a year after that. It was before, I think it was a year before the first Camp Blood. Holy crap. Yeah. You're talking about yeah. literally, okay. So our very first retro, well, it wasn't our very first retro show, but it was our very first horror show in 2014, yeah. literally uh, only a couple months off of our partnership. We played Nightmare on Elm Street. We played Tales from the Crypt, the original. Uh-huh. Dr. Butcher. Dr. Butcher. And I that was the first time I went to the theater. Was that yes. That, and that was literally wow. the first <laughs> entree of like what we do. We'd rented the prints wow. from Harry, so there was a connection. <laughs> and obviously the fact that we were showing like hardcore cool retro movies versus yeah. the first couple weekends, we showed Jaws and Jurassic Park as a, a test in 2014. But that uh -huh. was the kind of statement of, hey, we're going to do this. So yeah, that's what I'm thinking. You were literally there yeah. from the birth wow. of and it the was whole retro thing. It's just great i mean uh i have pictures from that but i don't i can't i was trying to do that last summer like go back through everything and be like when did i first go i know when i first heard of it and i believe that would have been back in like 2010 right when i first heard that you know there was this cool drive-in in carbon county that if you wanted to you could chill out and camp and stuff like that that would have been literally right on that cusp because Jeff yeah. was still doing the first run stuff up until uh, we came in in 2014. And you were there okay. at the end of that. So that was a pretty quick turnaround as far yeah. as uh, <laughs> it being on your radar. But you're fa you're fairly local, or were you at that time? I was at that time, and I still am. I live in a town called Minersville, Pennsylvania, which is uh, a town over from Pottsville, Pennsylvania, which is where they make Yingling beer. 
which is the associated uh, thing to the city. <laughs> but that's only about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, what a wonderful thing. But um, that's about. I say that it only takes me about forty minutes. But I'm like really familiar with the area. Like I used to work up in Tamaqua and stuff. So that whole drive isn't anything for me. It's a beautiful area, and it's a wonderful drive up there all the time. So I love it. Great early connect. Now, when did you yeah. come into the fold with? doing art it must have been pretty quickly after that i would need to look back but i it must have been about five years ago six years ago maybe i remember the initial kind of meeting of you and you had become kind of a regular on the lot but yeah. how that 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 connection crossed over to hey do you want to do art it probably was as simple as that i believe if i'm not mistaken it was i had talked to you and then I had talked to James and then I had just, you know, he has his own thing going on. So I just basically continued talking to you. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I think Gremlins would have been the first poster, maybe. If not Gremlins, it would have been like the Universal Monsters one I did with the, all the hands in the bucket. Yes. Oh, my God. So, yeah, yeah. that yeah. that was uh, definitely an early one. You know, that that's one that... The we got to get that reprinted. I haven't seen that in ages. I have a few left. I sell them every once in a while at like when I vend to Monster Mania. But you know, that's like a very specific thing, like to buy a screening poster. So luckily the art sells it with the hands reaching in the bucket and everything. Right. And that was, I, I love doing that one because I know like I went back and modeled all the hands after the characters in the movie. I do recall that. Well, you've been a gem for us um, and deliver uh, several posters throughout the season for us. And uh, it's a great connection. But what's your connection to the drive-in in general before you came to the Mahoning? Were you a, a drive-in kid? Were you lucky enough to have it in your childhood? Sure. And I believe you can help me with this memory. I had family. My mother's family was from Northeast Philadelphia. So we went down there fairly often throughout the year. And then during summer, me and my sister would spend a few weeks down there. And I think the first drive-in I went to, so I was off Princeton and the Boulevard in Northeast Philly. I think the first one I might have went to was in Bristol, maybe? Does that Bristol? sound familiar? Well, Bristol is definitely closer to me than, you know, like where the drive-in is. I'm trying to think of what the drive-in was, because it, it hasn't been there in a long okay. time. This was when um, it was a double header, and I believe it was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Ooh. and Arachnophobia. That was Come on! Header. That was your intro? Yes, and the best part was we went with my uncle's neighbor. We all piled in the back of his work van, and then when we got to the gate, we all hid so he wouldn't have to pay. <laughs> he, would have to pay for, he, he would have to pay for six kids. So it was funny, and I, re I remember the drive there because he had no seats in the back of the van, and I was trying to sit on a lawn chair in the back of the van, and I was not too successful driving through Philly traffic. So, <laughs> yeah, that's my first drive-in memory. And then I don't think I had another drive-in memory until maybe high school, but definitely in college. Yeah. Yeah, and that would have been up in the wilkes Fair area. That may have been even up at the Circle Drive-In now that they yeah, think Yeah, that's, that's the one that's that's still standing up in that area. I'm oh, sorry, yeah. I'm racking my brain on what the one could be in Bristol. I want it to be, you know, like the one, the Bucks County Twin I talk about all the time was in Warrington. And I'm trying to think of like the connection where maybe it's not far enough that, that that's the one you're thinking of in a perfect way. I, I would need to go back and look, but I... I thought it, it was wasn't like in the, the city, Bill. though. Yeah, like you're probably thinking of the one that Jeff used to run, which he showed me when we took the trip down, you know, into the heart of Philly. And you okay. can kind of see he would he pointed where it where it was, and you can kind of see it in the the skyline or where it used to be. Okay. Skyline. And then there's also now that I'm you're, you're asking driving memories. I know um, there's a Facebook group that, that I'm sure we all belong to that um, looks at different drive-in locations. There was one north of here, of where I live, up toward, I believe, Northumberland County, 
that was uh, the Natalie drive-in. Yes. Yeah, when I would go hunting and fishing with my dad when I was a kid, we would drive to like North Central Pennsylvania and we would always drive by there on a Friday night and I would always try to catch a glimpse because they definitely showed horror movies. And uh, like growing up, I didn't get to watch as many horror movies as I wanted to. <laughs> That's amazing. The Natalie, yeah. it's fascinating because they were a clone of the Mahoning. They were built by the same people or the same company around the same time. And uh, the ruins of it are still there. It's, it's rather close to Knobles Amusement Park. And you can walk in and you can see the sign is on the ground. And it, it was turned into a paintball facility at some point after it was a yeah. driving. So a lot of the remnants <laughs> you see now are of its last form, but the screen framework is still there. The snack bar is still there. Projectors were taken yep. out long ago, but the screen is on the, uh, the marquee sign is on the ground and it's that same arrow shape. It was just painted over to say paintball or something like that. Yeah. It's just so funny. Cause I do recall that Mark, when I went up uh, a few months ago, seeing the marquee just in the, in the mud, in the weeds. And I was yeah. like, oh. Like, that looks familiar. It's it's literally yeah. that. But it's neat to have seen that, like, kind of uh, decay over the years or be repurposed into other things. And then I guess the other one that I'm familiar with, the other drive-in would be toward Danville and Northumberland. If you're going out toward Northumberland, I forget the name of it off the top of my head, but that's still running. But they show first-run stuff. I think I might even call the Cumberland drive-in. That's it, Cumberland driving, yep. And that's one of those things, if you're lucky enough to have it, it, it as a youngster, it drives you to become a, a movie fan in general, or uh, in my case, performer, or in like a lot of cases uh, with the people that we're talking about, it kind of fuels the their fire and kind of uh, leads them in their direction. Do you think um, that that was the case for you? Did it, did it lead you down the artistic path or was that something that, that clicked with you? I mean, where, where I lived in the, in the 80s and early 90s, it was like a cultural void, which, I mean, that's a classic tale for most of us that don't live in an urban area. So there was this cultural void and you kind of had to expose yourself to what you liked, whether it was the music, the art, the film. And film definitely opened my eyes to a lot of creativity. And just the, the communal aspect of going to see certain movies, like that definitely was apparent to me by the time I got into high school and we used to go see like old screens of Friday the 13th at midnight or stick yep. around and go see the Rocky Horror Picture Show. So it, that, that did drive me. That was something that there was a sense of community and appreciation for art. And it really did snowball from there. Now that I think of it decades later, you know, yeah. and that's kind of like, that's kind of like the path for a lot of people in life. Like you follow your heart you follow what you love, you know, um, yeah, if you're lucky, if you're lucky. That's, that's your life. I mean, that's um, kind of the so mantra for, for somebody that's creative. And, you yeah. know, I think you were a lot like me in that sense where, you know, you were into a lot of alternative things. You uh, certainly had this uh, fuel and fire in your belly to, to uh, create was it was it art right away or did you dabble kind of like what I did? It was it was music, I, it was I, art, it was performance, it was all of it. Yeah, I mean I did. Um, it started, I would say like I, I always did art, but I guess it started with theater and doing like um, set design in theater and then love when it. I was in college it was music. Um, it was my love of music and I did a, I was a radio DJ. And then I was in a band for years. And then, like, I, I loved being in a band. TJ was in the band with me. So Come I on, couldn't that's ask perfect. For, that makes yeah. perfect sense, that connection. Yeah, so it was, it was great. But also, I was, like, throwing no shade. You know how it is. It's hard to work with several people and create art. Be on the same level, the timing. So at the same time, like, I was, like, I'm into music. I got into do more music merchandising gig posters, things like that. Yeah. And then like that, that's not bad, but like, that's not totally what I want to do with art. And it just so happened. It must've been 2012, I believe, um, or 2011, maybe I started doing posters, uh, with the colonial with Joel down there. And it was, it just opened a different Avenue and a different audience. And it was pretty, uh, opening and wonderful. And then of yeah. course I met you guys. 
Well, I think a reason a lot of we're blessed, by the way, with the connection, and that's the case with pretty much all the artists that have come into the fold is we really look at that connection as, as such a blessing. But one thing that seems to stand out when it comes to the appeal of wanting to work with us or somebody like the Colonial or whoever is it's an opportunity to work with some some serious licenses and do it uh, sure. legitimately, you know? Sure. Absolutely. And, you know, that's like when I was doing gig posters for years, that was kind of how it went. It, there was an approval process for the artwork and everything. And then I started to see what Mondo was doing because Mondo and Alamo started the whole kind of poster revival and actually doing high-end posters for individual screens. And they were successful for many years. And they, they opened a market worldwide that really didn't exist there and still does to this day. So it's just, it was something, you know, I wanted to do. There's Chris Garofalo that does it. There's also Justin Miller, who we all know, Haunt Love, oh, who yeah. does it. I, I was just, me and Chris and Justin were at Monster Mania a few weeks ago talking about how, you know, we started years ago doing gig posters. Now we're doing this and so many other things. And like, that's the beauty of art. It doesn't need to be one avenue. That's the beauty of how you guys are with your creative vision with everything. It doesn't need to be one thing. There, there's several different outlets that you can um, pursue and excel in and bring people into the fold. Yeah, and that's the beautiful thing. We always, when we first started, we relied on an all volunteer staff. We relied on artists to, to donate their work. And mm -hmm. our whole hope with that was that somebody's going to see it, it would launch into other work and almost tenfold that has happened with everybody that has worked with us. You know, I know Hayden sure. constantly working, you're constantly working. And it's like, it's a, yeah. it's a beautiful thing to kind of have the residency and that early passion and yeah. early like-mindedness to come around yeah. full circle. You know, it's a wonderful, I, I don't have any problem doing posters for for the mahoning for screens i love doing it i'll always do it as long as you'll have me but i get so much more fulfillment out of that than i do taking on commercial jobs sometimes it's kind of a breath of fresh air for your soul that you need to do for yourself at times yeah. i think um, luckily i'm in a, a position i can do that thank god well you've been amazing on every level and like i said i i, I have to talk about it because i think it's really what brought us together. Well, let's, let, I'll rewind it a little bit before that. So you mentioned Monster Mania and the convention scene. As an artist, yeah. that's something that you kind of jumped into. And where we kind of crossed over and really became friends was we did some vending at Monster Mania for a couple of years, yeah. New Jersey Horror Con, a couple other conventions. And you were there and you were kind of this guy who we recognized from the theater and was also here and connected in this world. So can you talk a little bit about the convention scene and kind of how that has pushed you as an artist or at least gave you the outlet as an artist? Absolutely. It goes back to like the early 2000s. So the early 2000s, I'm walking down South Street. I think me and PJ played a gig there. Kelly Cavanaugh was with us and we stopped to get a slice of pizza and we see a flyer for Monster Mania 2. All horror nerds were like, we're going. Robert Crazy. England's going to be there. <laughs> so we didn't know what to expect. And it's like over 15 years later, we're still going to them. You know, like it's yeah. insane in that respect. But it's finding a sense of community somewhere that, you know, you can thrive. So when I was doing the, the merchandising, I was going to these shows and I was buying stuff. And I was like, man, I would really like to do this. So luckily, I had enough of my portfolio from doing pop culture shows with Gallery 1988 and Hero Complex Gallery. I had enough pop culture and horror in my portfolio that I could sell it at these shows. Yeah. So I started doing that. And luckily, Chris Garofalo and I became better friends through that. So we were able to table next to each other. And I was able to meet other great friends through uh, the convention world, like the Studio House crew and Ian that does Ian's pumpkin carvings, yes. like all, all of those great people. All family members, yeah. Absolutely. Like, it, it's a great extension of love and community, and uh, I'm very happy to be a part of it. I'm very happy to 
be able to bring my wares to the people and have them buy them repeatedly. It shows me that at least I'm headed in some direction that's right yeah. with my art, you know, and producing something that's cool that I don't just think is cool that people want to wear or put in their home, Yeah, which is a great honor to me. One of the coolest things working with artists, and I'm so jealous of, of artists, seeing the development over the years. And the thing that I love about uh, your work is not only has it developed and I've seen you push yourself, but being in the convention market and knowing that you have this outlet and fan base and audience, you've elevated far beyond art prints. You, you now work with... Yeah resin and you're putting out figures and stuff like that you want to talk about what led you to that sure well i mean with that i always kind of thought man it would be great to to really do something with sculpture but i only i didn't really have any working knowledge of any of that and i had no idea that i was so close to so much of it so many resources for that and luckily it started with me just sculpting a little critter and then I figured, I, I think I went to Michael's and I got a kit to uh, like to duplicate that, um, you know, like, I'm sorry, just like a two part like silicone and then got a, a little resin kit. I made little. And that was the, what, the little critter. Yeah. And that was like, that was the start of me being like, huh, well, if I figured that out, maybe I could figure this out. And that's like creativity is, is that it's to me, it's always figuring out. It's a lot of problem solving management patience but it's always figuring out little things and that's what i i moved on to that that's why i screen print shirts that's why i do things like that i think we're as human beings a lot more capable than we give ourselves credit for i once said that to my dad and he laughed at me <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks <but> dad <laughs> I, I was like i was like i i think i made the comment i was like yeah i was like i bet most people if they apply themselves, they might be able to go become a doctor. And he was like, no, I don't think so. I was like, and now that years go on, <laughs> it's like, you know, we're all lumps of coal looking to become diamonds, you know, and pressure and time can do that in certain instances. And a lot of the reason I like, for instance, that I branched out into other things, you're always trying to provide other products and keep the overhead as low as possible. You want to figure it out yourself and how to do it yourself as cheaply as possible. Yeah. So when, like, for instance, when hard enamel pins became big, big, big in the convention marketplace, like I would say five, eight years ago, I was like, well, that's cool, but you have to communicate with a factory in China a lot of the time in the middle of the night. And uh, it could be a little bit difficult. And that's why I was like, if I could just do these little toys, you know, that would be kind of comparable for what I would charge a person for that. And the overhead is low. So and you can produce it in house. You don't have to wait for anybody. Yeah. You're your Correct. own production yeah. company. Yes. And like, that's the same thing with screen printing shirts. I have friends that do that. They have studios actually in their homes that... Yep. They, they have everything set up that they receive an order, they print it, and they ship it right out. And it's wonderful. That way you don't have to have a huge printing operation if you can't produce that to keep that. So, I mean, that's, that's really what the whole idea was behind that. To produce as much as possible, as cheaply as possible, that people yeah. want. And it does. It, it breeds creativity. When yeah. you... Uh, you in that scenario it's like i'm gonna figure out a way to make this work when i was recording yeah. not just in the band but before that like demo recordings things like that it's yeah. sometimes you can't wait for the other person like you said in the band or the other person to deliver and you know <laughs> along the route so you just got to kind of go for it and it creates something beautiful sometimes and the nice thing is with the internet and social media and everything, I've been able to interact with so many artists and most artists are very good people that just want to share their knowledge through the drive it alone. Like if I had not met Maddie Mullen or Eddie Kez that are sculptors and figure makers, I don't know if I would be like as far along as I am because just having conversations with them about how to sculpt stuff, how to cast stuff and, 
you know, meeting Garrett from Bootleg Bonanza and the whole experience of yes. seeing somebody that had taken everything but to a retail level. It's very interesting and they're very good people with sharing their knowledge. So it's just another thing that the Mahoning attracts like a certain type of person. It's it's really true. And I always say that to people. I'm like, we're all like very similar, even though everybody's very, a lot of the times people are different that go there, but we all have a central love. We're all very happy to be there, you know, and that's why it's always a good positive experience when we go there and get to spend time there. And that's why the winter stinks so bad. Why <laughs> we when it's void of that. Podcast. And we do the simplex screenings and everything, which I'm, I'm also very excited this year that I'll get to experience those, the private screenings. Oh, yeah. It is. It's it's a lot. It reminds it reminds us of the old days. That's what we always say. And for people who don't know what he's talking about, we have a Patreon. And if you are a simplex member in the Patreon, we do once a month private screenings on the lot for just those members. And it's a great core uh, tight knit group of people kind of just like when we started when we didn't have the weekends every weekend kind of be a big blow up situation it was hey I can come and enjoy it and especially the fact that you're close you know that's yeah. the beautiful thing is a, a Thursday a Tuesday a weekday for you is is uh, your bread and butter I'm very spoiled and this is this is like another thing and I think I've said this to you before for years for like 20 years almost. I never lived near cool stuff happening. So yeah. I would just drive everywhere. I would be in the middle of the week. I'd go to a concert in Philly, Baltimore, wherever. Just there was no kind of uh, that's too far for me. Mark was in the same boat. You know, as you know, Mark yeah. travels yeah. and traveled a long time. But if oh, there was yeah. something cool happening, he, he was going. Well, you have to you have yeah. to make it happen. You know, you, you, can, you can wish things were closer to you or wish you could do these things or you could just do them. So that's what I did for so long. And now I live, you know, two and a half hours, which is to me nothing from the Mahoning. And I live just outside New York City where it's almost annoying how much stuff there is to do on a given week. <laughs> You're spoiled. I yeah. love it. <laughs> and to go back to the Simplex thing, just so everybody knows, Simplex refers to the projectors we have at the theater, not to the members having a social disease. <laughs> <laughs> Your story of traveling to the Mahoning, man. I, I remember I was like, Wow. <laughs> I was like, it always amazes me how far and to what lengths people come to experience the theater. And I love it. Yeah, it's it's a destination. Like you said, it, it draws people in. If people are there, they made the trip. They made the choice to be there. It's not a casual Batman screening on a, th on no. a Thursday night. It's a dedication and a love for not just the culture, but the films and I used to say it a lot more on the radio sets, but it's true. You will meet your next, you know, leading actress. You will meet your writing partner. You will meet your your next lead guitarist because there is a magic and a kinship uh, happening on the lot. And uh, the, I, you know, it. the amount of friends made at the Mahoning, it's kind of staggering. Yeah, it, it, that's absolutely true. And it grows every year. I know you always say that, but it's absolutely true. I started doing shows down in Texas about six years ago and I did them for like three years and by the last year I did them what they were they were concert poster conventions so I'd, I'd take my gig posters down there set up a booth and and sell them in the convention center in Austin for four days and the last time I went I had a Camp Blood shirt on and people were like oh we know that place we saw the documentary <laughs> and I'm like what the shit so I went, down there, I, I went down there in October for Halloween to see Kelly. And I, I intentionally went to the Alamo and I went to a Terror Tuesday. And the guy that was hosting it, I had my Mahoney hoodie on and he knew exactly. He goes, oh, I know that place. Oh, I love he, it. He knew all about it. And I was like, that's amazing. I'm glad that you know about it because I, as much as I love Alamo, the Mahoning is a better place. <laughs> oh, that's sweet. We love everybody at the Alamo. And it's, it is, it's. The, since the word spread so much, it's it's hard because I get it. I was totally that kid in high school that loved the underground bands. And then when they hit, you know, there was an element of, but that's my band, you know, that's my place, you know. 
So I think there is some of that with uh, some of the early heads who got to experience us as we were growing. But sure. that's what you want of, you know, uh, a place that you love. You want to see it grow. You want to see it thrive. You want to see it challenge itself and push. You don't want it to become a comfortable, just, uh, you know, regular no. situation. There was no, I, I can't accurately describe how happy I was walking around and seeing the life on the lot at at the Jamboree because it was a payoff for a lot of people's hard work and dedication. And it was wonderful to see so many people enjoying it. It was an affirmation of a lot of people's hard work and it was beautiful. And those are the victories in life that you celebrate, the blessings you look back on, and thank goodness you have the time to experience them with the people you do. Yeah, when we feel so blessed in this whole journey, it really does feel like, you know, but it's it's this unbelievable scripted story that uh, we're on the ride for. And sometimes you got to pinch yourself and be like, did that happen? Like you couldn't script the, <laughs> the driving being saved while Joe Bob was coming into town and then having a huge blowout celebration of the drive in, which which blended with the celebration of the saving. It was storybook. Absolutely. I texted Jeff about the uh, the drive-in that you went to in Philly. The Roosevelt yeah. drive-in. That is correct. Ding, ding, ding. ding. ding, ding, ding. Leave it up to Jeff. Up you know, chances are Thank he you, ran it or was there at a certain point during its run. But oh yeah, let, let me pull up what he said. He said they actually took the screen to the point drive-in in Danville when the That's Roosevelt it. closed down. Yep and cut it in half and those were the two screens that they used at the point wow which i think are still there because we drew that's the one that i couldn't think of earlier the name the one in danville Um, yeah yeah, it's just outside of danville and it's like right alongside the susquehanna it's crazy um so let's talk about it you've had some serious experiences at the lot but if you had to name a couple choice ones that mean the world to you not connected to your work but just connected as a a lover of what we do where does your head go oh i would say well of course camp blood because that was i mean that for years has been like the reunion point for me and my friends every year we make sure that we try to come it's been a little bit tough the past two years because kelly's a nurse down in texas but um it you know it's it's always nice to come back to and absolutely every year for vhs fest that's something that you know i always see friends from all over the world that come to that but i would have to say I, I had a, a good time at Mean Girls Weekend. That was an unexpected good time. Yes, I you know, that that's been brought really up cool. multiple times. And it's, it goes yeah, out of Andy, our comfort zone. Because Andy was, like, carrying on about it all season. Oh, I mean, and I never saw Mean Girls. Yeah. So I went in totally blank. And it was just awesome seeing uh, that and Clueless together and so many different people that I don't think had ever been there before. So I can only hope that there are some more curveballs like that. Those um, are the events coming. we love to do now. And we kind of figured yeah. out with that event is, you know, sometimes it, it pays to to toss a different audience a bone. And even yeah. though we know we're going to get the poo-pooers that are like, why are you wasting a weekend on something like this? You know, there's a lot of thought that goes behind uh, behind a lot of the programming. So. It's, it's interesting because you're never going to please everybody um, no, when you're dealing with programming or it, when I was working as a DJ, Mark, you probably know too. You can't please everybody, but you just kind of have to follow your instincts. Like I remember when my friend moved down to Texas, there, that was a very similar thing that was heard about the, uh, the Alamos program. There's not enough horror. There's not enough horror. And then when there was too much horror, there was too much horror. Yeah. So, right. I think you guys do a pretty great job of balancing everything. And, you know, last year branching out with like the spaghetti Sundays and everything, I I just think that's the good thing. That's the that's the good fight that you have to fight if you love cinema. Yeah. And that's it. we said it and it's it's kind of selfish, but I look at it as before the pandemic, 
we were a Friday Saturday outfit and the decision to do Tuesdays decision to add Sundays it it became a thing where it's let's play let's play a little bit and again being lovers of movies like we are we want to try to tap as many different fandoms as many different genres do as many fun things that we can i always look at it as a tuesday a sunday a wednesday it doesn't matter if it's playing that's a bonus that's an extra mm-hmm. opportunity to come to the mahoning and have fun yeah Absolutely. So why don't you talk a little bit about your influences? You talked about always doing art and dabbling with uh, different mediums. Where does that influence come from beyond uh, movies? I would say comic books, late 90s comic books were the thing that started my love of illustration. And uh, then, you know, as everything happens, you, you discover more and more. So I discovered like Jack Kirby and Obviously, Frank Frazetta was a huge influence on me. I like to think every time I draw a woman that I, it's like with a Frank Frazetta woman in mind. You're channeling you know? Frank. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, there, there is a lot of great art in Pennsylvania and a lot of great artists in Pennsylvania. You don't have to look very far, I feel like, to be inspired. Um, but definitely comic books in the 90s played a big part um in all of the uh, in, in influencing my love of illustration and then uh i would say heavy metal magazine um that was also something that i found as a kid that tales from the crypt and old ec books um those are things that i love kind of like, shape just... who you are as a kid too you yeah. know the yeah. alternative yeah. stuff you are able to dig into it you know absolutely so you know, I find inspiration in that. There's always been a love of, like, heavy metal art in, in me. Like, the old album, you know, painted album, album covers, covers from yeah. the 70s and 80s. And, you know, that informed a lot of my creativity. I would also say just being a Nintendo kid from the 80s is a huge influence on me. I loved issues of Nintendo Power when I was a kid. Because back then, they hired a lot of illustrators to do spot illustrations in them. So I have like a stack of like 40 of them from when I was a kid. And I went back and I looked at some of those spot illustrations and they're, they're pretty cool and they're very yeah. unique. And I'm, I'm surprised they, I, I'm sure they had somebody internally do them, but it captivated me as a kid. And I remember like just sitting there and redrawing that stuff and redrawing and, you know, repetition is a great teacher. So <laughs> yeah, I'll have to show you some of my old drawings from like when I, I used to sit around like in third and fourth and fifth grade, like on the weekends. And I would just with a stack of paper and draw because a lot of it was, you know, as a little kid, the time we grew up, it was just, there were so many toys and action figures and everything. So everything Mm -hmm. I saw, like, Oh my God, I want that. But you know, you can't have everything you see. So then I would just in turn draw it. Oh, that's so cool. You're like, well, I can't have it. I'm going to have it. I'm going to have it. Yeah. I'm going to create it. That's so cool. I feel like that's like a driving force for a lot of the, like music. You know, you're creating something that isn't there. Right. You know, I always think like car guys, guys that like find an old car and then just put it back together. Like we're going to see during Mad Max weekend. <laughs> I went through my pictures the other day and I forgot. Maybe you remember this. I'm sure he'll be there again this year. There was a guy that had this car that's held together with bungee cords. It had no windshield and no top on it. <laughs> and he was ba- he was like parked next to where I camped during Mad Max weekend. And he was absolutely insane. He said he went up the Northeast Extension doing like 70. In that thing? Like, no- <laughs> yeah. It's like a, with like this make and it's like bungee cords holding stuff together. I'll send you the picture. It's absolutely oh, that's nuts. amazing. That event draws yeah. them all. The wasteland oh, yeah. crew is uh, dedicated. I'm hoping we see some some vehicles this year. That I'm would sure. be cool. Oh yeah. yeah. You mentioned your influences. It's so hard for me to describe an artist's style. How would you uh, describe your your artistic work? I would say. <laughs> I know. It's like oh. hey. Can you button this up in a nice, pretty bow? <laughs> the one thing I hate 
doing the most is describing or giving a biography about myself. Because, but so if I had to say, I'd say that it's an illustrative style that at times could be more photo real, photo realistic, but is definitely influenced by a cartoonish nature at times too. Yeah. And that's kind of what I like about the way I approach different posters is some artists very much want to do a kind of like a formulaic design or have an aesthetic and that's wonderful but i always approach the posters i do is they have to be a, a unique entity of themselves they can look like they can look like other things but i strive for them each to be individual and that's what i think is so cool about the the resident artist quote unquote is you know you have the opportunities and you can kind of stretch and be like i'm gonna try a different style with this or i'm gonna cater the style a little bit to this and we've certainly seen many many amazing works if people want to see uh some of chuck's event posters they can cruise our instagram and certainly be flooded you could go to my instagram horrorprints.com but just real quick to get back to what you were saying about being comfortable and being able to work within uh, a certain parameter with the relationship that y you have. Years ago, I started doing gig posters for a promoter in Philadelphia, R5 Productions. And that guy was basically like, do whatever you want. Yeah. And then as I started doing more band merchandising, they wanted to direct me more. And that's fine, but that comes with a cost. And, uh, but all of the best work I've done has been like where I've been given a little bit of slack, I feel. I did a series of posters a few years ago for the electric factory and that was very much the same way is that i got to work with higher profile bands and stuff like that but use my artistic interpretation of things so that was nice and those are always the best situations to have yeah what's your favorite i know i have a couple of your favorites do you have a favorite or uh, where does your mind go to when you think about the posters you've done with us at the mahati i would say the favorite would either be the never ending story. Oh yeah. That that's that's my favorite. Just because uh, there's, there's a beautiful a story behind it. Why don't you uh, let people know? Okay. So this past 4th of July, they showed the never ending story at the Mahoning and we had Noah there, the actor that played a tray, of course. He was signing on the lot and uh, anyway, I did the poster for it. The story behind it is the never ending story is a very special movie to me it's the first movie i ever saw in the movie theater when i was a little kid it scared the shit out of me <laughs> um, there's a lot of meat on that bone yeah yeah so uh, it's a good memory it was me and my sister my mom and then during what was it 2020 it was when you first showed it yeah i believe yeah so on 2020 it was during a pandemic we were all very much scared under lockdown still and the Mahoning was one of the places that you could go where you could keep your distance from people so I would go there like you said I live close I would go there a few times a week uh, all the while I'm trying to convince my mom mom come with me come with me you'll love this place so I eventually get her to come for the never-ending story you know we had a wonderful time and then later that fall my mom got sick and unfortunately she passed away from COVID-19 from complications of that. So it was a really rough time. And, you know, I talked to Virgil and he knew that, and he knew he was doing never ending story. And he came to me and said about doing the poster and uh, just weird because sometimes without knowing it, you get yourself involved in things that end up saving you. You guys are that way, whether you know it or not. I, you know, you've had that influence on me. And uh, if I didn't have that and other projects focus on, I don't know if I would have continued to do art like I am. Because at times you, you question yourselves. You go through things that alter your life forever. And um, it was it was a nice thing to focus on to have the creativity to push to do that, to know that it was a special event and I could honor my mother that way. Yeah. And um, it was special to have you there 
Uh, my sister Kathy got to come. My, my niece got to come and be there. My friend Melissa, her son, my friend Chris were all there. Her mother was there. And it really solidified how special the Mahoning is to me yeah, and to all of us. And then I think it was like, what, it was two weeks later when Joe Bob was there. Uh -huh. And uh, that just ties back into the story that I was saying before, walking around so happy to see the And your art arrive. was secured that weekend as well, uh, kind of yes. unexpectedly, which was great. <laughs> and, and I think that story, it always moves me because that's the the special magic that not just the mahoning has but movies and the experience that you have at them it comes with and to have uh, a place that you can come to and and honor the the memory of your mother and have that uh memory that's always fresh and you're able to come and be with her in a way is uh yeah. it's beautiful you know and i felt yeah, so yeah. so honored because you know, not only were you the perfect artist for that event poster, but that's my go-to as far as uh, my favorite for you because it really oh, felt you. elevated, you know? And anybody who sees that poster can certainly probably feel that. And it should be mentioned, we sold so many of those posters and <laughs> Noah signed so many of those posters and you did as well. That was an amazing, yeah. uh, an amazing event. It truly is wonderful to work with you guys and... The memories that are made on any given weekend at the Mahoning literally last a lifetime. I can't say that enough. Yeah. It's a wonderful place, and I love you guys. Oh, so sweet. And it is. It's tough to say, like, hey, what's your favorite this? What's your favorite that? It's like, I just love the magic of being there. Every night, I don't know what to expect, and there's a certain uh, sure. a certain coolness in that, you know, to just be able to be uh, – with your people and let the, the, the magic happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And now this season, you got a new style and trailer. That's right, out. baby. Upgrade. Yeah. Whenever, <laughs> whenever Chuck bends for VHS Fest, I know where he's going to be set up. My trailer is off to the left of the screen. And uh, we always put Chuck right there in front because, again, you've become way more than you know, a fan, a big supporter, a person that works with us. It's, you are a true friend and compadre. And it's a nice kind of segue. I'll, I'll talk about it. It, it. So I guess right around that time, 2019, I had lost my best friend to an overdose. And when something like that happens and you're open about it, you know, people come out of the woodwork to uh, show their love and their support. And some people just don't, you know, and you kind of see where somebody's heart or friendship lies and you were so so sweet and helped me through a really hard time and that's really when even though we were already friends through the experiences at the conventions and at the mahoning that's what really kind of elevated it and for me and nancy and the family to be like you know chuck is just an all-around gem of a guy so thank you for being that for us absolutely dude Absolutely. It's my pleasure. You know, I've been very fortunate in life to have a lot of love. And I try to, that's what I try to give in life is love. You know, I try to try my best. We're all not perfect, but hey, that's what you strive for. That's right. Day. It's the people yeah. around you, you know, that really, uh, you know, can lift you up and elevate you through the good times, the bad times and through the creativity. That's the, the greatest yeah. gift of this whole experience at the Mahoning is even though there's a lot of destined elements to it, you know, it's something I've been talking about for a really long time. And now that it is what it is and has become the more people that we can get involved and kind of help shine a light on what they are and what they do is just such a bonus. You know, the event poster thing started as purely a, a means of like, let's, make this a little more like a rock concert than a a, a movie sure. going experience. you can come you can get sure. the, the prints and the little merch and you know the the overnights make it feel like a, a weekend kind of concert getaway and it were it snowballed into something that you know you could have never dreamed it would be it's now every weekend every event we got a cool poster an amazing artist yeah that's great and it's great that you work with so many artists and you give people the opportunity 
that's crucial you yeah, know absolutely that's something that you have to support if you're an artist you have to support art you have to love it and that's that's true of the artists that i know but it's interesting because as you were saying like how you'd lost your friend and everything i know that season like that play seemed to take on a different dynamic to you or at least i began to understand what that place meant to you a yeah. little bit better i feel like it means something different to all of us because we all understand how fleeting the moments of joy are in life and the older you get you don't want to take those for granted and that's that's kind of a lesson in the joy that we get with the mahoney you know not yeah. to take it for granted absolutely and now after everything we went through last up your damn garbage chuck <laughs> it's true and after everything we went through yeah. last year it's it's even more solidified we're incredibly yeah. blessed to have this uh this place for all of us to love mark you want to you want to pop in with some questions for for uncle chuck well i had two and and we were talking about the the joy and and the love that mr Ma, if i may monsignor moran brings to us each and every week uh for me <laughs> the first moment of joy was when you came up to i was working at the cash register and snack bar you came up to me and you handed me this framed original mahoning handbill flyer from 1981 for the cannonball run when it was playing there knowing how much yeah. that movie meant to me where did that come from okay so i'm gonna say his name and he's gonna if he ever hears it he's gonna be really angry i said his name but i love him so he's a good guy i have a very good friend bill harleman who works with the historical society in lee heighton and has lived up there i believe his entire life so he's a local, he's a wealth of knowledge about everything. Yeah. So one day we worked together. One day he came in and he gave me that. And I was like, oh my God. I was like, you, I was like, Bill, I was like, I want you to know, I can't keep this. I have to give this to somebody. He's like, that's fine. So that's where that came from. Bill had that in his collection. He's, he has a very large historical collection of local I guess, terra firma and everything else. But he has a great story. He remembers being, now Bill might be maybe 15 years older than me, maybe. So he has a memory of going there when I believe in the 70s when he was a kid. Oh, yeah. And he would sneak in through the back, like I guess where along the back where the airport would be now. Right, yeah. So that air like he used to sneak through the back and i think he said they used to show adult movies maybe <laughs> <laughs> yeah which is funny but um the neat thing is i got him to come out to a few screenings so he's been to the mahoning he's been and he loves it uh, awesome. i don't need to tell you guys it's always good to have local friends yes. um oh, yeah. and local supporters and that has been so crucial, I think, the last year that, you know, forging those relationships and making sure that they're still there um, and that you can help your neighbor. You know, that's big in Pennsylvania where we live in, in this area. People want to help each other out, you know, if they can. We try to do that with all the community screenings and screenings for yeah. school groups and all that stuff as, as often as it's feasible for us. We try to make sure. that happen when somebody approaches us because I mean, not just for the you know, thinking somebody will do us a favor in the future, but it's like, well, we've got this amazing thing. Why wouldn't we want to share it with people and let people yeah. who might not have otherwise come out before get a little taste of what yeah. the experience is like. For years um, in my local community, I was involved with the Lions Club and that's what we would always do. We had a pavilion that we rented out, but we always made sure to make time or community organizations if they needed to do a field day or something like that just to make it available to them yep. so that they could experience that because it was it's surrounded by like soccer and baseball fields and all kinds of cool amenities but that's important to give back not just to make it sound like ah, i know this guy i'm keeping an ace in my pocket yeah but yeah share what you have of course i always love the connections too well people who come and say I experienced this in the 60s and the 70s and, you know, when they yeah. were revival fans, you know, that discover mm -hmm. what we're doing and are so in love with the idea that 
their childhood drive and is is still thriving. And I always grill people. I say, well, what was it like when you were here? Is it, what's the same? What's different? Yeah. Is, yeah, I want to know. <laughs> I want to know the history. And of course, the, the way we run the operation is, is fairly unique. So I always wonder what somebody makes of it who used to just roll up, watch a movie and leave when we've got merch tents and vendors and carnival acts and photo ops and all this other stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Literally carnival oh. acts sometimes. The, the other thing I wanted to ask is uh, yeah. some people may be aware that we had lot cats uh, at the Mahoning uh, yeah. last season, uh, a pregnant mother kitten, apparently very young. <laughs> we started jokingly calling her teen mom and uh, a friend of mine who now uh, has her, uh, had her checked out and she literally was about as young as you could be as a cat to have kittens. They were living on the, on the property for a while and the time came, they all had to find homes and you graciously took one of them. And, and what is the cat's name and, and how is the cat now doing? The cat's name is Norm. I'm watching him eat at my feet as we speak. <laughs> oh. He's like quadrupled in size. He's, <laughs> he's a nice little kitty. Growing he's wonderful. Boy. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, it made, like, now that I see, like, I, I never had a, a four legged pet before in my life. Wow. So, I assumed you were yeah. totally like a cat guy. Oh, no. Oh, no. And then, like, I get this thing, and he's like a spaz for like <laughs> first like two months. I was like, "Oh my god, is he gonna calm down a little?" And then, you know, I had to I had to get him fixed, and uh, that did calm him down a little. But he's wonderful. Norm's wonderful. He's named after my favorite Canadian, Norm Macdonald. What's your dream double feature? If I had to pick a double header, if there was a way to do it, I would probably want to do like a Sunday night, like Disney, and do it back to back to Mr. Boogity and Bride of Boogity. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. That's Hell yeah. Perfect. I'll tell you what, like a <laughs> hunting crowd, that, that probably wouldn't lose money. <laughs> oh, no. Andy would talk about it for a year. <laughs> you, would get, you would have you would have the hype man on it. I think Andy likes that movie. Oh hell yeah! I know I've talked to him about it before, but yeah. So I went to see him and Kelly at the beginning of the year. I stopped down, saw him in the Lehigh Valley. I met Norm's brother, yeah. and because um, they have because they have one of the other lot cats, and they showed me the movie Shock Treatment. Yes, and you guys, you've seen Shock Treatment, right? It's fun. Oh my god, is that a fun movie? Are you trying to plant the seed to make that happen? That would be neat. You're like just that saying. Also, you could just go ahead and show Phantom of the Paradise again every season. It's funny that you mentioned that because I'm good friends with Malcolm Ingram, a documentarian. And uh -huh. his most recent documentary is totally about the Phantom filming in Winnipeg and the fandom around it. And yeah. I'll tell you why. Like, it's a no-brainer. I said the last time we played it, it was amazing not only an amazing crowd but having who was it ian up on the ian, ian, ian yeah. in a very accurate phantom costume with the voice uh changing modulator or whatever yeah. standing on the roof of the snack bar just like i don't know challenging everybody or or berating everybody he was issuing uh phantom statements from the top of the roof it was <laughs> <laughs> hella photo i have video of it and you can hear him verbally accosting people through his uh modulator <laughs> Perfection, normal oh. owning style. So since you have the uh, the mic and uh, our audience obviously loves you to pieces now, why don't you tell them about any upcoming projects, where they can find you, all that good stuff. If you want to check me out, feel free on uh, Instagram is usually the best way. That's where I post all my new work at Horror Prints, H-O-R-R-O-R-P-R-I-N-T-S. Also, I'm on uh, TikTok as Horror John, that's H-O-R-R. -R. I'm gonna have to follow you on TikTok. Yeah, it's pretty, it's interesting, the stuff I post on there, because like, I post like ridiculous stuff on there I don't anywhere else, like videos and stuff. <laughs> it's a whole other outlet. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and like, there's everything from like Deathmatch Pro Wrestling on there, to concerts, to me making toys. So awesome. it's a different outlet and avenue. And then I'm Horror Prince on Twitter as well. And 
you can go to my website and check out my portfolio, uh, www.horrorprints.com. I got to ask, how long have you been going by the moniker Horror Prints? Maybe eight years. I've owned the URL for a while. That's what I was thinking is it's such a gem name and sure. gem moniker. And like, how do you get lucky luck- that somebody didn't snap? I lucked out. Or, you know? I used to work, dude, I used to work for um, a network domain company. So uh, maybe about 15 years ago. So I registered a bunch of good URLs. Oh, so and that smart. was one of them. That was one of the ones that I registered and I was like, I'm going to make something of that. Yeah. So I've just been chipping away. And then for That's a while, I was like, my gig poster work, I was going by the name Zomic, Z-O-M-I-C. So then like, as I started to do more horror conventions, I was like, yeah, I don't need to, I need to focus on the horror prints more because it's such a, a nice name. A great brand. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we definitely have a, a couple more offers for you if you'll take them as far as poster Absolutely. work. So we will definitely be in touch. Absolutely. I can't thank you enough for being such a, a great supporter of the theater and beyond that, such a great friend. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. And I look forward to seeing you the end of April. Dude, it's an honor. Can't wait to get back into the madness. Heck yeah. Tuesdays, baby. I'll tell you. I love Tuesdays so much, and Harry is bringing the heat. And Don't tell people. <laughs> You're like, we want it to be our thing. But yeah, like and me, and the brothers, me and the brothers say that all the time. We're like, Yo, <laughs> you hope the I'm word gonna... doesn't get out? Yeah, don't let Harry hear you. <laughs> it's just so funny. And then there's um, Nick that's like, he, he like he's like, I can't believe they're doing it to us again. And I know. He's like, if I get there, I have to work the next day. I'm like, I know, dude. <laughs> Figure it out. It drives people yeah. nuts. Tuesdays are stacked, and I say it like we're hoping that it grows this year. But Tuesdays for me on a personal level are always so much fun because I know you're going to be there. And I know that there's going to be always those uh, friendly, familiar faces and regulars that we can enjoy some nutty movies with. The cool thing is about the Tuesdays is I have found there's an entire group of people that go to the Tuesdays that don't necessarily go to anything else. That's why we started it. You know? Yeah. There's the people who are like, I work weekends, bitch. I'm yep. the opposite of you. <laughs> yeah. My friends that are all like tattoo artists, a lot of them will go up to that because Tuesday is their Sunday. So you're doing the Lord's work. That's great to hear. That's great to hear. Keep that in mind, folks, when you see it. And we always say, what are we going to play garbage on Tuesday? Not going to happen. Every time we have the opportunity to play something, we're going to hope it's a banger and we're going to present it as such. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Chuck, thank you so much. Check them out. Support the hell out of them. We love them to death. It's true. I would just like to say okay. one more thing. Yeah. If it's okay with you, I had uh, one of my best friends passed away tragically a week and a half ago. I'd like to say RIP to Scott Brower, Scotty Blunt. I love you. And uh, rest in peace, brother. This is for Scotty. And you sent me a beautiful text. A picture of the lot saying like, hey, I had a really uh, rough day, heard about my friend and, you know, came to my happy place to get out of my head for a little bit. Again, yeah. you know, anything that uh, that we can do to be there for you and to try to strengthen this this crazy world that we live in, you know, yeah, we're honored to do so. So, Scotty, rest well, in peace, brother. You got it, man. Thanks. And on that note, Jeff, take it away, my friend. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks again for coming out tonight to the Mahoning Drive-In Theater. We hope you'll come back and see us again real soon. The exit is on the right-hand side of the screen at the front of the field. And most importantly, have a very safe trip home. Good night and God bless you.